Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're listening from. Thank you for joining us. On behalf of Mazone, I want to welcome you all to Women's Equality Day, a conversation with Mazone and Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. Thank you so much for joining us for this important conversation on a day when we commemorate the centennial passage of the 19th Amendment and women's suffrage in the United States. My name is Mia Hubbard. I'm the Vice President of Programs at Mazone, and I have the great privilege today of moderating our discussion. For over 35 years, Mazone has been committed to a vision that regardless of a person's circumstance, no one deserves to be hungry. In a time when truth is under assault and moral clarity is in short supply, we aim to be a voice for both, offering an honest perspective on the reality of ending hunger and forging solutions grounded in Jewish values. Now, as COVID-19 has ravaged our country, it has thrown into stark relief the realities of hunger in America, the limitations of our government systems, and the inequalities that have persisted for generations. This crisis has truly shown a spotlight on the gaping holes in our nation's nutrition safety net. And it should come as no surprise that those who are most affected by the crisis and our federal government's lackluster response are women, particularly those who are working on the front lines as the majority of service workers, women who are single heads of households, and women who are struggling to find work to pay for the basic necessities like food. So that brings us to today, Women's Equality Day. We're here to commemorate the centennial passage of the 19th Amendment and women's suffrage, while also acknowledging the inequalities that permeate our society. Gaining the vote was a 150 year struggle for women, one that offered the promise that women's voices would be fully resonant in our country's decision making, in our leadership and in power. But sadly, that promise remains unfulfilled. But I'm thrilled to be joined by two female leaders who are fighting to fulfill that promise. I'm joined today by Abby J. Liebman, my zone's president and CEO, who has a long record of community leadership. For over 25 years, Abby has worked and led some of California's most prominent nonprofit organizations, including the California Women's Law Center, where she, which she founded and directed for 12 years. Prior to founding the California Women's Law Center, Abby was the directing attorney for community programs at Public Council, where she developed and then directed the organization's child care law project and managed a project to provide pro bono assistance to nonprofit organizations. She also has served a two year term as one of five civilians appointed by the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors to the equity oversight panel for the LA Sheriff's Department. And joining her is Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, who represents Connecticut's third district in the United States House of Representatives, where she also serves as co-chair of the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee. A longtime member of the House Appropriations Committee, Representative DeLauro currently chairs the Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education Appropriations Subcommittee, where she oversees our nation's investment in education, health, and employment. The Congresswoman also serves on the subcommittee responsible for the U.S. Department of Ag, Agriculture, uh, where she oversees um, central uh, critical um, anti-hunger programs like SNAP. And prior to her being elected to Congress in 1990, Representative DeLauro served as the first executive director of EMILY's List, a national organization dedicated to increasing the number of women in elected office. So we're in great hands today. And um, before we get started, I wanna let folks know that you are also invited to be a part of the conversation. So please submit your questions in the comment box on the live stream, or you can email them to mazone at mazone.org. So I wanna get started with a look back at history. And I'd like to ask both of you to um, just take a moment to reflect on um, what moments or individuals stand out to you uh, from the last 100 years since the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, Representative DeLauro, would you like to get us started? Sure, sure, thank you, thank you so much. Well, first of all, just let me say thank you. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Mia, it's wonderful to be uh, with all of you today and Abby with Mazone. 
Uh, it is about three decades of service, advocacy, grant making, uh, leading voices against hunger. And we all concur, any, all of you and everybody who's on the line, no one in the United States of America should be going to bed hungry. There is no reason um, uh, uh, for that. And uh, what you have done in, in, you know, from a small grant making organization to become an international leader uh, and advocacy for uh, food security. And that's whether or not it's in the US or in, 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 uh, in, in Israel. So I'm so delighted to be a part of this. And Abby, when um, uh, Neil was talking about you, it just brought to mind, you know, your, your what was it, the, 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 the child care law project what we need to do, and maybe we can work together and collaborate that with a new administration, uh, there can be a, uh, uh, you know, a, a commissioner for, for, for children or for a, a, a child advocate or so forth, and uh, let's put our minds together and outline something and then go to the newly elected president and say, we need to look at all of the programs that we deal with and how they are affecting children in our country. So. Uh, I'm gonna to look to you for guidance uh, um, on, on, on that effort. But the moments that you have, I mean, look, there are some stellar moments that we have looked at. Uh, you know, we've got so many, the, the, the history is so rich with trailblazers uh, in the fight for equality uh, in, 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 in this country. You know, you can go back to the Abigail Adams, to uh, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's and Susan Anthony, Hillary Clinton, Kamala Harris, uh, so forth. But uh, you know, I just we I took a look at there's some there, there's some pieces here sometimes that we forget. You know, first woman uh, of, 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 of elected to the House of Representatives in 1917, Jeanette Rankin, and she bridged the two wars, and where she said, "I cannot." Uh, only person said, uh, "I I can't." to war on, 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 on two occasions. Frances Perkins, who is my personal hero, um, uh, the first woman to hold the U.S. cabinet post. Um, I, I, her policies were the policies of the New Deal. And the first fact, she wrote after she fired, so she went lost about safety. In, uh, in, uh, uh, it was a uh, in '55 launching the civil. Event. Lyndon Johnson '64 with the civil, you know, civil rights, uh, uh, and, uh, and and Johnson did an incredible amount with regard to women's um, uh, 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 ec equity. Roe v. Wade. I, I forget Shirley Chisholm, 1968, the first. You, you know, African American woman elected to the House of Representatives, and then '72, she, uh, you know, makes the attempt to run uh, for, for for president. You know, we've got 1994 Violence Against Women Act, Nancy Pelosi, 2007, becoming the the woman's um, the first woman speaker of the House of Representatives, and regains the title in 2019. So uh, we we uh, the. What is so critically important for us uh, to be thinking about is the, the milestones, but they, they, there are people who have stood up, fought for, and have created the opportunity uh, for us to try to move uh, forward. Those stand out, but there is yet more to come. And we're going to uh, look at the, the election of the first African-American woman as vice president of the United States. Uh, and that we know what that means for the future of this, of this country, for women uh, and for women of color. Absolutely, absolutely. Abby, are you still with us? I got there. there I'm go. sorry. So <laughs> sorry, my, I, think the, I think the power surged, my internet went out, uh, you know, technology is great until it doesn't work. So sorry, I am back. Oh, it's all sorry. good. <laughs> So, oh, good. Um, good. It's too human for the world. It's definitely okay. mm -hmm. human. This is this is real. This is live. So, Abby, I, I, I'm sure you have some thoughts about this because I know you have a um, you are a bit of a history buff, but particularly for women's history. Yeah. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, one of the things I love about um, the the women's movement for suffrage is that it it modeled a lot about what we know about how movements work in the United States and everything new and it, that we 
Mm. Uh oh, are we have we lost Abby again? Many of the leaders, the early leaders of women's of, 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 of women's suffrage came out of the abolitionist movement. Then these were long before what we think, I think is the more popular moment of um, abolition. So the Grimke sisters were these remarkable sisters who um, were very vocal advocates um, for abolition and began to include issues about the importance of women in that struggle and getting recognized as women. And um, the, this was probably like, like 200, almost 200 years ago, probably when they first began doing this. And so uh, apparently from all the reports, um, they had incredible speaking voices. It was like listening to music to listen to them speak. And of course, it was long before we could record it. So I, I long for mm. being able to hear those voices. Mm. And and then there are the, the, the leaders that are you know, more and more well-known to us. I mean, Susan B. Anthony became the, the face of the suffrage mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. and, and, but Elizabeth Cady Stanton was really the driving force. Um, they, were, they had a remarkable partnership that um, lasted longer than most marriages do. I mean, it was well over 50 years. They were constantly in each other's company, and they, um, they were both very public figures of their time and um and the you know there are remarkable people that whose names come to mind for us like sojourner truth um and um who helped to build and broaden that movement and what it meant and did some of that crossover between the abolitionist movement and um the suffrage movement and when we talk about what is normally thought of the second wave of um the women's rights movement, which is in the 50s, 60s. It started with Betty Friedan, Gloria Stein, and Bella Babs, you know, these big names and stuff that, um, I think that what it's important to do is to remember the, the women whose names we don't know. The, the women who formed the backbone of these movements, they're remarkable photographs of these women who were standing long lines in horrible weather conditions so they could try to vote and then they would get arrested and which was all part of a strategy so i mean there are no we do all the same things that they did you know and they and then you know the pardoning of susan b anthony at this moment um it was you know it's sort of an unfortunate lack of context around the history of this i mean she wanted to be prosecuted that was her that she needed to get into court because she wanted to argue that she had a right to do this and um it they oh and she didn't think she had done anything wrong right <laughs> well yeah exactly well that's what she wanted to be able to do but if you don't yeah. arrest me and let me get in a court i didn't I, this is right. exactly what she wanted this right. was a strategy right. <laughs> so go ahead and roll me in the briar patch that's right. <laughs> right 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 she was i did just um and apparently she spoke she always wore a red shawl and she was world famous for this and then she would go and you can tell i get really into this i get excited i'll finish in a second but you know she um would walk into a hall crowded with men and women in fact often more men than women because they had more freedom and flexibility in their lives mm. ah, what a surprise mm -hmm. um and they would all start clamoring chanting where's the shawl where's the shawl and she would whip it out in a really dramatic way and put it on before she spoke and i mean these are things that these these people had such a presence in wherever people were. Mm -hmm. And the final thing I will say is that um, one of the reasons I think that we have unusual impressions about Susan B. Anthony is because the imagery of her, first of all, photography was weird in those days. I mean, you had to sit still for a long time with an expression, so most people didn't smile. But she was, a, a, apparently, she had an amazing smile that lit up the room. She was, mm -hmm a warm and engaging personality. And that's not what we get. What we get is, here's this harsh and, right. mm -hmm. and spinster that, you know, is angry and, and because that fits with a narrative of what we think of when we think of women's rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think- Now, um, one woman I want to mention as well, Mia, is Mary Norton. Mm -hmm. And I have to go back, I, I, you know, what she did, you know, it's a, it's a very funny story. We worked, I worked with George Miller uh, and others where we got her portrait into the education and labor 
uh, room in the House of Representatives. You know, she was on the Labor Committee as well as on, I think, House Administration. And when the gentleman who uh, 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 died on the Labor uh, uh, Committee, and she was next, they made um, uh, an assumption that uh, oh, it shouldn't be, stay with House Administration, stay with House Administration. And she said, mm -hmm. no way. I'm going to the Labor Committee, and we had child care centers that were set up by Mary Norton, and then after the war, they were gone, you know. Uh, I once had a conversation with John Dingle, God rest his soul, uh, who, who, you know, with his dad, with him, and et cetera, and he knew her, and he said, an extraordinary, extraordinary woman. So, you know, right, some of the names that are not as familiar uh, to people that have made amazing strides. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So for I, all of us. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, at this time when our country is kind of grappling with our history around race and, and gender, yeah. I've been really, really struck by um, the fuller stories that are being told right now about the women's mm -hmm. suffrage movement and mm -hmm. some of those folks who were those, you know, women who were invisible. Um, and I think, you know, when history is looked at through the eyes of, um, of those women who are lesser known, um, mm -hmm. women of color, um, it kind of complicates the narrative and, and challenges some of our myths, right, that we right. kind of tell ourselves in, about our country. And, um, mm -hmm. But we end up being able to tell a much richer story and I, I think have a better understanding of our history and, and, and who we mm -hmm. are and how it connects to the present. So um, I'd love to um, talk a little bit more about the present, actually, and um, mm -hmm. turn to the issue of hunger. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, we continue to, to center our conversation on the experience of women. But I'd love to hear um, how you all see the, un, the kind of the unequal burden of hunger impacting women in this country, um, particularly um, now, and, and how you see it shifting and changing as a result of COVID, um, particularly because we have a lot of economists who are who are calling this recession the the the, the she session, right? Because it's it's had such an impact on women. Um, so, how are you seeing this um, this moment in, in terms of? of the impact of, of COVID and, and, um, and this, mm -hmm. there's this, this economic crisis we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I, I, I think what this crisis has done, it's obviously a healthcare crisis in which we have um, uh, uh, overall, but I think it has exposed uh, inequities that we know existed in the past. We know that they have existed. But, uh, and the way sometimes I, I, I like to portray this is while we are fighting the virus uh, 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 on health, we have to fight the virus on the economic injustice and the disparities that, that, that are there. And that is, I view as part of where we, where we need to go. So we have seen the unbelievable uh, inequalities um, uh, 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 and new ones as exposed by the, the virus, especially for women and women of color. And we know, this is the data, this is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Women have been hit the hardest by the economic fallout of the pandemic. There was an April story, I believe it was in the New York Times, about who the essential workers are. And they are women, writ large. And the, the article went on to say that they are underpaid and that they are under uh, value because women are employed in the industries, uh, hospitality, uh, health care, education. Uh, they have lost jobs disproportionately. That's the highest number of unemployed uh, that we have. Um, uh, that, and uh, just a couple of statistics. Uh, and we know that there are more women of color who depend on food stamps. We know that um, uh, 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 to be able to afford a basic diet. So we need to understand as the Congress, the disproportionate impact as we take a look, not just at this moment, because as I was saying before, we need not just to look, or we have to grapple with this moment, but we have to debate the policy solutions for the future. Uh, and, and again, a, a couple of statistics, and I will hush up. Women are 63% of the adult recipients of 
of, of, of food stamps. I, I want to call it food stamps. I know it's a SNAP <laughs> program, but people know it as food stamps. This is what this is about. You know, we try to color these things with, you know, supplemental nutrition, uh, food insecurity. It's about being hungry in the United States. That's what this is about. So women, 63%. White women are 24% of non-elderly adult recipients, 32% of, of elderly um, uh, adult recipients, women of color, 34% of the non-elderly adult recipients, 31% of elderly adult recipients. 18% of non-elderly women recipients are women with disabilities. Uh, and 58% of all SNAP households with children are headed by a single adult, 92% of them by women. This is about women and their families. And we, I, I have fought for years and years and years on the food stamp program. It's Genesis, what it recognized, and it was a bipartisan issue when hunger was recognized in the United States and the history of people like Jacob Javits and Dole and McGovern, yeah. like people who came together that said, we have a problem with hunger in the United States, we have to deal with it, and they came up with the programs. But it has been a nightmare um, uh, in, in, in the last 20 years of fighting for food stamps to feed people in the United States. And all of the data says that this is an issue that affects uh, mostly women and their families. Uh, and that's why we need to make a connection here. Mm. It's not when we talk about how women are affected, this is about hunger, but how women are affected in terms of health disparities, how women are underpaid and that's paycheck fairness and paid sick days and so forth. That has to be aggregated so that we are telling a unified story about women in the United States, despite the gains, where they are in terms of their economic security and stability for the future. Wow, I don't know how much more I can add to that. <laughs> um, I, let me say, first of all, that I, when I came to Amazon nine years ago, um, yes, there was a very different tenor around this issue from what it has become. And actually, I'd say probably my, it's only my seventh year here. I don't know when I got, I've been here for a couple of years. I think Mia when this <laughs> became apparent to me. Yep. Mia has seen this over a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, the intersectionality, the holistic nature of women and their lives that the Congresswoman has articulated so beautifully is what we are very ill-prepared and negligent in mm -hmm addressing legislatively. Our policies mm -hmm. tend to hone in on one particular problem and see, oh, we're gonna fix that without paying attention to what this would mean. Right. right. So mm -hmm. Mazon has been front and center and part of a strong phalanx of anti-hunger advocates arguing that we need SNAP to be more available. We need SNAP to be a greater benefit. We need it to be um, flexible. And underlying a lot of that is not made explicit, but is somewhat implicit that the people who access this have to be able to access it in a way that makes sense for their own lives and how they can get to it. So there are requirements in lots of states, for example, that in order to get SNAP, you have to appear in person for an interview at a social service office. Well, in COVID, that became dangerous. And therefore, there were waivers granted to not allow that, but we're moving back to that state. Well, think of yourself, you're a, a single mother, you have two small children, you have a job, let's even say you could do that job remotely. What do you do with your two small children in order to go get that SNAP benefit? Because we didn't prepare and think about that. When we think about who's the average recipient of these benefits, we don't tend to think of a single mother with children. And because of that, we overlook some of the things that they need. Are there child care services available at Department of Social Services offices? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, is there the opportunity to consider if 
you are separated but not divorced from the father of your children, that getting access to him and his financial records might be dangerous for you because you're separated because he beats the crap out of you. Sorry. <laughs> um, that um, you are, you have to think about what's happening in the mm -hmm. real lives of real people and not one size will not fit all. It's a great starting point, but in, if you can't get it, the benefit might as well not even be there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's the point that you just made, Abby, on being able to, you know, to have to appear in person. We have been trying uh, and really with the USDA and this was being able to access the benefits online. And we were dealing with yeah. seniors and yeah, right. they, they, you know, you couldn't go out and still, and still we are fighting because it's got to be state by state that makes the application. Right. I've asked yep. for, and we have people like Debbie Stabenow, myself and others, uh, how do you, uh, how can't we get a blanket waiver uh, here? Right. Um, uh, and we're still working on that. My staff is still working on that piece now with the disability community. So uh, it, it, it's just re remarkable. Look, we were also was working with, with Kamala Harris before all, all of this happened at the outset when we're trying uh, to look at uh, 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 the benefits that are associated with, uh, uh, with an, uh, disaster. You know, natural disaster, the, you, you can get a, a food stamp benefits if there is a hurricane, a fire, a flood, or so forth. There are, and that happened in Katrina. But mm -hmm. why, they wouldn't classify COVID as a, 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 a disaster, which we couldn't get. And, the, and one, of the, one of the critical pieces of that, I might add, is that those benefits would be available to folks who are here, who are, yes. Um, kids should not starve, you know, uh, and so forth. So uh, there are so many pieces and you, 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 you are right. I wanna make that point over and over again, which is I think where we all need to go. And Mazon will be very helpful. We need to uh, uh, connect the dots. Absolutely. on all of these programs right. to yeah. help them with the difference. So, I mean, Mia knows this well, I know, and I know the Congresswoman is familiar with this from Mazon too, because one of the things that we've done um, during my tenure at Mazon is to start to think about where is the larger systems and advocacy failing certain populations that may have special needs, um, meaning that for us, we, we've we're nimble enough, we're kind of small enough, you know, that we can actually pivot a bit. And we look at hunger in ways that others don't necessarily have the capacity. So when we think about those, those populations that currently serving military, where we launched an effort eight years ago to just what we thought was a simple change and couldn't move it forward. And interestingly, we've gotten tremendous support from women in both House at the Senate. Interestingly, not resonant so much with um, some of our male leadership, but um, and we have worried about seniors for a while. We worried about LGBT seniors who have much more particularized needs than the general senior population that, and then and tribal nations and people who live in rural America, all of whom have, as we've seen, I think the pandemic threw a lot of this into high relief. Mm -hmm. what, what the gaps are in the safety net, where it's not really working because this one size doesn't fit at all. And then as we began to look at single mothers and their children, which as you said, Congresswoman, mm -hmm. there are a huge percentage of the people wow. struggling with hunger in America. Which, so these special populations for us aren't small necessarily. It could be huge, but we have not thought about this. We have not done that connect the dots in terms of how we think of policy. Yeah. And the zone is trying to do that, Wonderful. to try to move some of that yeah. forward. And yeah. to think about even where these populations intersect, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. are you know, female-headed households in the military who struggle more than those that are headed by either two parents or male parents. What a surprise. You, know, mm -hmm. you see these mm -hmm. things over and over, and you begin to say, there's a pattern here that we can address. If we could yeah. just think about 
who people are and what their lives are lives really are about like exactly right. and I, I got i want to just I, and i know you have more questions than me but I, I just i think this is this is so critical because what i found when i was you know we were all making the fight on equal pay for equal work that was a discussion we were doing paid sick days paid uh, paid family uh leave uh, looking at um uh, you know uh, schedules that work you, you know be, but they were one it was one at a time they were like we were the crazy ants in the attic who were you know these are issues that affect women it's not blah, blah. once and I, I feel very proud of this and i don't mean to be self-serving i i was the architect of when women succeed america succeeds but what we did and i worked with people like Heather Boucher and National Women's Law Center and the National Partnership, we all sat together with all the groups saying, what is the agenda? Mm -hmm. And I, the success of that has been on these issues, which is why we need to go back to this model with all of us together again, is that paid sick days, paid family leave, it's on the table. It's in the HEROES Act. Yes. You know, companies are dealing with it today. Yes. Equal pay for equal work. Men and women in the same job deserve the same pay. Front and center of the debate that we are having. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, schedules that work, front and center of the debate that we are having. So it's now we have to deal with the agenda as people are actually living their lives and mm -hmm. what is important. Right. When we get to a childcare industry, it is collapsing. Yes. And if you can't send your child to a safe place, you're not going back to work. No. Because right. your first allegiance and love are your kids. You're not going to abandon them. So we've got to get to that model again, like you have pointed out, at Abby, and pull these other pieces in mm -hmm. uh, that, that can help us to put this debate again front and center and not be forgotten. I, 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 I have to just say one more thing here, Mia. Sorry. Sure. Oh, uh, this is great. Yeah. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> there is there is no doubt in my mind, and I think that what Congresswoman Deloro has made so apparent is that women lead differently. Yes. We approach issues differently, and we mm -hmm. approach how we manage those issues and how we make change differently. There's Congresswoman, you have not uttered a sentence without talking about who you worked with, which other women take the lead on this. There's an element of collaboration right. and lifting up of others that is a hallmark of how women lead and how they make change. They are, yes, we are often the marginalized and crazy people <laughs> ranting about something that, if we're lucky, becomes commonplace. Now, some of what I tried to bring to Mazon was that sensibility. So we see ourselves, if we can get any one of those issues that I mentioned earlier into the mainstream, we say, look at that. We were a success. We were over here all by ourselves. And everyone said, are you crazy? Are you crazy? This could never happen. Mm -hmm. And now other people talk about it all the time. This would be true about campus hunger, something that we launched years oh, ago. God. And now everybody talks about, it. again, young women affected there. Um, but it's like, the idea that our work as women is to make that which feels strange or out of sync with what's normal um, become acceptable and normal. Mm -hmm. And I think it's women like you who fully embrace that. I think we've seen it in Senator Stabenow. I, I see it in, in Senator Harris. Yeah. I see it. In Murray. <laughs> Murray. Senator, Senator Murray. Murray. Senator, and well, Maxine Waters. I mean, we have the, the women. Right. And I look on my side. Right. It's unbelievable. <laughs> right. What do, you know, the Catherine, it's everybody. We're, you know, you work at these right. things together. Right. You have to. Yes. You know, you're, right. And it's not, it is not about you. It's not about me. And it's not about the organization. It's about the issue. It's about making change. It's about being a voice for all of those women and girls who are struggling in silence, who may not even realize that they are mm -hmm. struggling and that there is a barrier to them that others don't experience. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to engage for them, to take those risks, to stick our necks out so that they don't have to. 
and then we can lift everybody up. And there's no doubt, of course, at this time, what we can see, if you lift women out of poverty, out of the devastation wrought by a recession, then the entire economy benefits. Women are an integral part of that economy, and we have to accept it, and our leaders have to act like it instead mm -hmm. of castigating them yeah, or it's, punishing it's a, them right. because they can't work and raise their children at the same time. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I want to stay on this leadership issue because yes. I think you all are right. There's something <laughs> special about how, how we use our voice and how we lead. Um, um, Representative DeLauro, I want to ask you, you know, how do you, how do you work with colleagues um, in Congress who, who vote against women's um, best interest. Like, it, it seems to me, and, and, and even women across the aisle, I mean, are yeah. you able to, in, are you able to find um, a place of commonality, you know, kind of woman to woman, or are politics kind of, you know, overshadow everything? Mm -hmm. Well, at, at, at an earlier time, uh, in, in, you know, in my tenure, uh, the area that where women uh, came together overwhelmingly, and I'll, I'll give you some examples, was about women's health issues. Okay, women's health. And there, you know, look, where we worked with uh, uh, Connie Morella, uh, uh, Pat Schroeder, Marge oh, Rauchema, yeah. uh, uh, you know, as well as Nita Lowy, Nancy Pelosi, myself, we were on the Appropriations Committee. But there was an understanding that, I mean, the, the, the first and foremost example, I use it all the time, is that what we found that uh, minorities and women and women of color were not part of the uh, uh, clinical trials uh, at the National Institutes of Health, that they did all of their testing with men and then extrapolated right. to women. <laughs> Rocket, I mean, whoa, physiologically yeah. different. Are we crazy? <laughs> Norm, but this group, and it was, you know, Nancy Johnson in, in Connecticut, you know, Barbara Kennelly, there's a whole, there were Democratic and women, uh, Republican women who came together that pushed the edge of that envelope so that today women and, and minorities are included in the clinical trials at the NIH. There is an Office of Women's Health at the NIH. Mm -hmm. Didn't exist before. Now that's not, that's about 30 years ago. Yeah. That's just 30 years ago. And we still have to, on a regular basis, and if we were on this call to Francis Collins, over and over and over again, we, we talk about, Anita Lowy, about women's health, you, you know, and t talking about uh, what they need to continue to be doing and spending the money on the research. But that was an, exa an, an, an example. Women, you know, we, you have to reach out, you know, a legislative body, you have to create the coalitions that will get you across the finish line. And that's, you know, women do not make up the majority of the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. But when you ask me, so we have to reach out to our uh, 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 female colleagues. I, I will just say, though, today it's much more difficult. There may be on some health issues you can get across the aisle collaboration, but on just about everything else, we cannot. On equal pay for equal work, they put up women Republican members of Congress all of the time when the debate comes up to be opposed to it. It's really, really ex ex extraordinary. But the body is one in which you need to reach out to your uh, female colleagues and your male colleagues who are like-minded in order to be able to create the coalition to move forward and get you across the finish line. And that's how you have to work. And it's mano a mano, it's one by one, going to, you, you know, to talk about the issues, how important they are, what they mean. And I'll just throw this one line in for you. Women today in the House of Representatives, and it's true probably in Senate as well, have to work harder, know more <laughs> about what you're talking about to be able to pull in our colleagues to be able to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. so. I think that's a truism in, in so many areas of, 
of mm -hmm. work and in, in so many industries where right. women are, are right. struggling to, mm -hmm. to make their, their power mm -hmm. and their, their mm -hmm. voice heard. Um, Abby, you know, I wanted to ask you about leadership from the kind of advocacy side. Mm. Um, you know, the, the anti-hunger community historically has been um, a white middle class dominant, you know, um, male dominated field. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering kind of what, what that you think that has meant in terms of our movement? How has that affected you personally as, as an advocate and a leader in the field? And, and you know, how can we address the, the gender gap in our, in our, in our advocacy? Uh, so in some ways, I feel like I should turn this question back at you. Um, I've been doing this a lot longer than I had, but um, people who don't know me is <laughs> with my zone for over 25 years. So there's a, I would say, I, I think there are more uh, men of color in leadership um, than, and obviously the, the head of America, which is the largest anti-hunger charity in America is, is a woman of color. And I think those kinds of shifts are important and they are um, more than just symbolic. I think they, again, they message not only what the organization's embracing in terms of the, the idea of who is hungry and how we have people in leadership who can talk to them and about them, but also they will think differently. They will approach things differently. Um, I think it's really across the country where you have so many local based organizations, many of which are come out of um, volunteer efforts and then you know, people rise to the top there. Um, the nonprofit sector itself just generally is very male dominated in terms of leadership or the rank and file will typically be female. Most of the volunteers will be female and then the heads of these organizations will be male. And there's a, there are lessons about the glass ceiling that um, probably don't have time to go into here, but I think that it is, it's still there. I think there's some places where it's ratcheted up. The ceiling is higher than it once was, but I think it's still there. And you, I mean, we had um, in the history of this country, we can see that there are many places where we haven't seen women break through. I mean, California, which is supposed to be so progressive and we are so out there, we've never had a woman governor. Um, we are, you know, we pride ourselves on being forward thinking and egalitarian and supportive. And yet we are still a part of that kind of mainstream way of thinking about what a leader looks like, which I think is part of the challenge is that we, we haven't seen it. So we can't figure out how to embrace it when it is in front of us. Mm. And I think that Congresswoman, when women run for office, they often have to run into this, which is, you know, mm. you don't look like what a Congressman is supposed to look like, which of right. course you don't because you're not <laughs> right. a Congressman, but it is, it, it's, the brave women who embrace their difference and don't allow it to be dismissed, where you, you seek to say that, yes, as a woman, I look different, I have different needs, I lead differently, but you cannot punish me because I am different. Yeah. You must embrace that difference and hold it up for just what it is. It brings some strengths, some challenges, just as men in leadership do. And globally, when we think about those, those kinds of gender differences. And for me, personally, look, I came out of leadership, not only of an organization, but an issue was just female dominated. It just mm -hmm. by its nature, because it was women's rights work. Um, and um, it was a bit of a shock for me. Um, although I will tell you, frankly, the bigger shock to me was to find out how white the anti-hunger movement was. That was more shocking to me. Yes, it yeah. did. And mm -hmm. I, um, I was somewhat surprised that there weren't more women in leadership at the time. I, I assumed this um, responsibility, but, um, but the, I can remember me being on a plane with you going to DC where mm -hmm. we were talking about the movement and I'm asking you questions and you said to me, it's man, the move is a very white movement, and I was shocked. It just didn't even occur to me that be the case. I mean, I'm used to in women's rights work where people have always accused that movement of being way too eccentric and work to extend that. Um, and then when everybody was getting slammed by the Republican leadership um, in the uh, 80s and 90s, you know that we all sort of came together and tried to move that forward. But mm -hmm. I, 
I think um, there is there is nothing that moves things forward the way diversity can. And it's not diversity for diversity's sake. It's because those different perspectives come in the room, different ideas, different creativity, different experience, which helps to inform and lift up everybody because we are now thinking about what everyone has in mind. When I did women's rights work, one of the things that I used to say to people is, you know, if a Martian landed in, in, on earth and looked around and looked at America and said, wow, this is truly weird. <laughs> you have half of your humans that you don't allow to exercise their creativity, their intellect, their wisdom, their connections, purely because they don't have the same anatomical appearance as the other half. Just think where we would be if we had mm -hmm. harnessed the creativity of women and the marginalized people of color in this country for all of its 200 year history. Just think what we could have done. Absolutely. And yeah. we're now playing catch up in a really big way at a huge cost. Um, and I, but I, you know, which is so, so exciting about the, 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 uh, the House of Representatives uh, uh, t today. Yeah. You, you know, where you have, you know, over a hundred, you know, women who are serving, most of whom are who aren't Democrats, you know, it's women of color, it's Native American women, LGBTQ. It is, mm -hmm. the, it, it, it is the broadest range. And those, those you know, when, when, the, when you're sitting around the table, and to be very honest, I mean, I think it comes to my mind is the whole issue of, of maternal mortality, you know, which is a significant problem for uh, women of color and African-American women primarily. But around that table, along with Alma Adams and Robin Kelly uh, and um, Lauren Underwood, you know, are myself, uh, uh, you, 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 you know, and Jan Schakowsky, and you, you know, the, the whole full range of people who understand, you know, the issue and saving women's lives. You, you know, which is where we, 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 need, we need to be. And I think in some instances, women, we've come of age in this regard. One of my staff people that during the election said to me, you know, yeah, there are lots of women who are running, but they're running against one another. Whoa, time out. This is good. Yes. You know, I mean, yes. this is not, we're all in this. You know, right. we are participating with the fullness of, 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 the, of you know, right. we are more than half of the, of, of, the, of, of the workforce, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the country. So that, so that there are, there are the, the signs that, um, that, you know, we're, we're, we are beginning to uncover the strength of that diversity and mm -hmm. as it affects women in all aspects that we're, you know, including obviously, you know, the hunger piece of, mm -hmm. of all Absolutely. of this. You know, working carefully with Barbara Lee, you, you know, and the, you, mm -hmm. you know, um, and yeah. anyway, so I, I, you guys I, get it. I, I completely yes. agree. And I guess I want to just say as, as a woman of color in this movement, I think um, it is a very white movement. Um, and I think mm -hmm. as a result, it's, um, there's a, a color blindness that kind of dominates the movement mm -hmm. um, and has for far too long. And I think it's, you know, kind of depoliticized our, um, our work and our inter interventions and the solutions that we promote. And, um, you know, I think we reproach policymaking as if it's gender neutral or race neutral. And, you know, we can see from COVID and the disproportionate impacts on women and communities. It's not, these are not, these are not neutral in these mm -hmm. ways. And so, you know, we really need to um, look beyond the surface and, and look at the disproportionate impacts, racial and gendered harms, you know, that these policies are, mm -hmm. are causing and, and call it out. And I think that our field is just now reckoning with this issue mm -hmm. and, and the need for more diverse voices so that we can do a better job mm -hmm. at really centering issues of gender and race and equity. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I- You know, I, just, to, just to say, you know, uh, people say, yeah, we have to have more women who are elected to the Congress, which I agreed. I worked at Emily's List. And, First political director, but it is about the agenda. Hmm. It is about the agenda, and that agenda changes hmm. yeah. when women are in the conversation, and that's the importance. 
in my world. Yes. That's, that is the importance in, in, my, in my world because some of these efforts, not that everybody is mean-spirited, doesn't want to do it, not on their mind, not on their mind, but women bring that perspective, mm -hmm. you know, to the table. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I want to, um, speaking of agenda, I want to, um, to ask you all um, kind of as a closing, as a closing um, for the program mm -hmm. to just reflect um, on, on a broad agenda and, and to share mm -hmm. your vision for, for the next 100 years in terms of women's equality, in terms of combating poverty, mm -hmm. um, and, and ending hunger. Mm -hmm. um, why don't I start and I'll uh, let the Congresswoman have the last word. I love um, it. And, I, you know, I, I did give some thought to this question um, and um, remain a little bit unclear on what my thinking is, um, just to be honest. I, I, you know, there's there's often the thing that advocates will say about how, you know, we just want to put ourselves out of business. But, you know, when you work in anti-hunger, there's no such thing. We will never completely end hunger in America. What we can hope for is a time when there are fewer people coming onto benefits than going off. Because what we would need is such a revolution in our economy and the structures that support people as they age, let alone at times in their lives when some kind of tragedy strikes or when tragedy strikes so many of us as a, in a global pandemic that we need to have systems and structures in place that can respond. We always will need advocates to make sure that that response mm -hmm. is on point and meaningful. And what I think is that what I would, what I really want is I want to see leaders that govern with both wisdom and compassion. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. one without the other is a failure of leadership. I know there are lots of things that go into being a good leader, but those two bookend for me, what the qualities are that will help drive those other leadership traits and skills. And if you are leading with both wisdom and compassion, you will have that perspective that helps you balance what your intellect is telling you with what your emotions are telling you and what you can see. And as we we look at our world and we see that the United States is dominated by women and women of color who are struggling. I want to have a time when we won't even have to point that out, that it'll just be recognized so mm -hmm. that then we can do the hard work of moving something forward. I'm not naive enough to say, oh, I just want it to go away and it'll just disappear. And that's not going to happen for a really long time. But if we can, at least as you've just said, Mia, recognize that we have something to reckon with here. Mm. And that's the first step. So I see that if we have those leaders who bring what they know, what they feel, what they've heard, that they really listen, then we're a long way forward in really making that significant difference that we're all hoping for will be the result of all this hard work. Oh, beautiful, really. Um, what an honor to be with you here today. You, you know, um, uh, I, I, I go back to, because these, these two words, um, are, I, I always, I use them in connection when we talk about women's uh, uh, health and particularly around the issue of, 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 of choice. But I think that they transcend all the issues that affect women uh, and women in, that women, their work, who they are, their role in our society, I believe has been undervalued mm. and has not been respected in the way that it, 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 it should be. And that's clearly true when we have the debates around women's act of re reproductive rights, but women need to be valued, they need to be respected. And that means what we do is level that playing field, making sure that women have the same rights in the workplace as men, the same access to opportunity as men. Get the support in government policies that they deserve and have a right to. That's what I'm, that is where the, uh, 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 the, the, it, it, the 
this movement ought to be taking us uh, for, for, for women. So there, there is no debate or discussion about how women are uh, not paid the same amount in the same job as a man. We should not be having that discussion any longer. It's over. It should be over, and I hope it will. Um, and then when you look at the, so that all of the areas that we deal with women's lives uh, and lives of their families, that that level playing field has got to exist. When I think about the war on poverty, when I have hunger ending this hunger, it's a major, it really is from a passion. And I didn't know that the case. I went to Congress to help mm -hmm. to deal with health care issues and so with my own experience with cancer. But the, the world of hunger in this country, and that goes, you know, Robert Kennedy, and I just will quote, he said, I believe that as long as there is plenty, poverty is evil mm -hmm. and, uh, and government needs to be present wherever there is an evil and be an adversary of evil, which is what we have to do. And we, I guess last week, in addition to women's suffrage, we're celebrating the anniversary of the war on poverty. And yeah. that was a, it was remarkable on what we were focused on, you know, at that time. And now there is a new war, if you will, on mm -hmm. poverty with us being able to recognize, we knew at the time who were the underserved, but this virus has all the more heightened what is going on in the lives of communities of color um, and the, the systemic racism uh, that exists. And so we have to take that down because the single biggest economic problem that we have today is that people are in jobs that don't pay them enough money. They cannot make their way. Um, and uh, so we've got to deal with the jobs, with health care, uh, uh, with lifting them a child tax credit, which would lift, uh, you, you know, and African-American children, more than half would be lifted out of poverty if we expanded the child tax credit uh, in, this, uh, in, 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 the, in, in this country. So they have been on the chopping block, all of these efforts. Uh, we need to galvanize and make sure um, that, uh, uh, we're averting those attacks on the social safety net because this represents our values and mm -hmm. we need to go back to those values of who we are as a country uh, and what we, what we are about and where our priorities lie. And they do lie in the equality piece and in the area that you're talking about with regard to food, uh, et cetera, et cetera, we need to make sure. This is a land of abundance in the mm -hmm. United States. There are some countries that have to import all their food. We produce more than enough. And I'll go back to where I started. No one, no one in this country should go to bed hungry. That is a result of policy decisions that are made, not because of any of uh, uh, technological efforts or globalization. It's the policies that we choose to make that will make a difference. We can do this. Mm -hmm. I'm an optimist. We can wow. do it. So, thank you. Um, thank you. No, thank you. Thank wow. you both. I, I, you know, I'm, I, the passion is palpable. I, I, um, I really am inspired by visions that, that both of you put forward and, and just the possibility that we could deliver on you know, the gender equality that we've been fighting for, for, you know, over a hundred years. So I, I just, I want to thank you both um, for your passion, for your, your voice, for being a champion for, um, for, for women, for girls, for families, for, for vulnerable communities, um, and for sharing your, your experience and your wisdom with us today. And um, I also want to thank everyone who was listening for, to this important conversation. And um, today marks an an important moment in the fight for women's equality and the fight to end hunger. And we clearly have so much more work to do. Um, and I'd like to ask you to join us um, by donating to my zone today. Um, we are um, marking Women's Equality Day and we would love for you to honor um, a woman in your life um, or someone who has fought um, so hard over the last 100 years, or for a woman who will be fighting for the next 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, donate to honor women who are struggling every day to feed themselves. Mm -hmm.
Um, today's conversation has made it clear that America is beautiful. And I think Representative DeLauro, you, you, you spoke to that. Um, but its colors do not shine equally bright across the land. We are mm -hmm. blessed with an abundant natural resources and with a politic that prizes the power of every vote. And this is a nation where no one should face hunger. And yet we struggle with equitable access to food and creating a safety net that leaves no one behind. And at Mazone, that, that really is our sacred charge to ensure that a government of the people works for all the people. So please learn more and, and donate today to mazone.org. And with that final call to action, I wanna thank you all again for joining us today. Thank you, Representative DeLauro. Thank you, Abby. Um, and stay well and be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is wonderful. And Mazon, thank you so, so much for what you're doing to you change people's lives. Thank, thank you. you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.